Uh, okay, folks, we're going to move on to our next uh, session, which is hitting the jackpot, which is so appropriate for Vegas, uh, enhancing medical education through grant funding with uh, Dr. Mike Gottlieb. Take it away. Thanks, Matt. So uh, my name is Mike Gottlieb. Hey, everyone. I'm just going to come from behind there. I don't really like saying behind the podium. So my name is Mike Gottlieb. I am the uh, Ultron Director at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. I'm an Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine. And the purpose of this talk is to be a primer for grants, for the medical education. What I tried to do for this is basically lay out a grant piece by piece, highlight pearls and pitfalls. I talked to a countless number of people who have gotten funded from small grants up to multi-million dollar grants. I've talked to grant reviewers. I've reviewed about every single lecture that exists out there and uh, tried to summarize it up into about a 25 minute primer. So like any talk, this isn't meant to be all encompassing. This is meant to give some ideas to start improving your grants, whether you've submitted before, whether you haven't, and then applying it across to your grants at home, and then trialing this out, because that's the best way to get good grants, is trialing it out. Now, importantly, I have no disclosures to declare. And so, as we start to go through this, we're going to talk about grants in general. We're going to add the medical education components of it. We're going to add specific pearls and pitfalls. And how I like to think about grants is, it's like the first time you did an H&P. Do you guys remember your first H&P when you were a first or second or third year medical student, you had to do that H&P, and you put it together, and the physical was somehow in the history, and you forgot all the social history, and then you concluded too much social history, and you go through all these stages, and you get better and better, and now we can do an H&P in about 30 seconds of rapid fire talking. We get better with experience. Grants follows the same thing. You start to learn the protocol, and those who are successful at grants learn how to play the game and learn how to follow the rules. Now, why does it matter? Why should we spend this time? Because we're all busy people. Why am I going to spend this time doing this? Well, for one thing, it gives you funding to allow you to do big, bigger and better studies, more impactful studies, getting into the bigger journals like academic medicine. And not, it not only allows you to do those specific studies, but the funding you use for that, for example, research assistance, can then now be used to fund future research assistance. You can use this to now share that research assistance across a couple of studies. So one grant can actually lead to a number of projects with one round of funding because you're covering a lot of the cost from that. P&T. That comes up, I'm not sure about your guys' shop, but on my research pillar of my P&T, grants is the top thing. It's above publications. So not only does that grant help you get promoted, it helps you get the higher impact factor, factor that, again, helps you get promoted. And it brings in money to your institution. It, helps your, it makes your chair happy. It makes your department happy. And that makes us happy. All right. So... Couple of, a couple of avenues. So when I think about, grant, about grants, I try to think about the different ways we can get to them. And so the easiest ones are usually internal funding. I can almost guarantee that most of your institutions or affiliate academic institutions have internal funding. The problem is we may not know about them because they go out via listservs. At Rush, they go, a large portion of our grants go through our philanthropy office. Who would have figured? Our philanthropy office sends out this listserv to an internal group. And if you don't know about it, you don't know the grants exist. And the only way you find out is reaching out to your Office of Research Affairs or your research director and saying, hey, are there any internal grants I don't know about? Please add me to the listserv. And then you're a part of a small cohort in a much more competitive arena, or much less competitive arena. A lot of our specialty groups, SAM, CORD, ASAP, all have local society grants. Again, we're re dealing with a smaller cohort because we're dealing with just emergency physicians and often just with a specific specialty or subspecialty, a, a different focus. And so for, you can go through those. Even if you just type into Google SAM grants, it'll pull you to a whole list of resources, including all the available grants we offer up here. When we talk about industry funding, my brain thinks, oh, NIH, R01s, and K grants, and I say, I can't do that. That's too intimidating. But there's actually a ridiculous number of smaller federal grants that exist out there that we just don't look for. There's a website called grants.gov. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's really worth going to. It sorts it out by the due dates, by the type of grants they fund, and it has a lot of the smaller grants that we don't often think about. Grants.gov, worth checking that out. And then industry funding. That always makes me a little uncomfortable because I don't love the idea of industry funding, but it is another avenue to think about. And there are pros and cons to that, and I'm not pro or against that. I think we just need to be cognizant of the risks and benefits. So there are pros to this. If I wanted to do industry funding, for example, if I'm going to, I'm an ultrasound guy, so I might want to do an assessment of 
ultrasound with a simulated program like Sonosim. I might reach out then to Sonosim, understanding I have no vested interest in them, but as an example, I might reach out to them and say, hey, would you be willing to loan me your machine or fund me for this study? Well, that's a little bit easier than some of the federal grants. There's less competition. Their application is much easier as well. It's not as rigorous as the standard grant forms. But now I, ha I know when I write that paper, they're going to say, oh, wow, he got funded by Sonosim. Well, that's, I don't know if I can believe these results as much. So there's a COI, a conflict of interest, that comes into play. And that can actually linger for quite a while. Um, that can affect some of, your public, so, some of your presentations as well if they remain relevant. So it's something to be cognizant of. Just something to think about. Now, if you are going to go for industry funding, there's a few small tweaks you want to keep in mind. One of which is there's not a standard grant application. It's not like how you would go online and search it out. You have to reach out to someone. You, that means you have to know someone there. And so often that means you have to have a connection in there. So it's reaching out through your rep to someone up higher or sending an email to someone who's in the higher area of that. And you have to be able to speak their terms. They don't speak in grant terms. They speak in ROI. What's their return on investment? So if you're going to pitch it as industry funding, you want to tell them what they get out of it as an industry as opposed to what society gets out of it, which is what we normally try to pitch it as. So it's just something to be cognizant of when we think about our different avenues. And typically, it helps to start small. There is a subset of us that will go straight into a K and then an R, and that's awesome. But most of us are going to start a little bit smaller. You start to learn the process. They're less competitive. They're a little easier to go for. And then you start to build a track record, because most grant funders are pretty conservative. So if you go right out of the bat and you have no research training, and you say, I'm going to go for a big million dollar grant, they're going to say, prove to me you can handle a grant. But if you have two $10,000 grants, even though it's not a lot, it shows a track record of success. And we know that past success predicts future success. There are studies showing that people who are previously grant funded are more likely to be grant funded in the future because it shows past success. It shows you can do this and you will do this. Now, when you're applying for a grant, there's something called an RFA, which is a request for application. It's basically like an abstract of the grant. It says what the grant is, what they're looking to fund, and when it's due. And make sure you read it in full because there are going to be small things that you might miss in there. One of the biggest um, challenges that can come up is that some grants, especially the smaller ones, which is probably a large portion of our medical education ones we go for, do not allow for a uh, non-clinical buy-down, and they don't allow for uh, indirects, which is the proportion of the grant that goes to the institution. Problem is there's, a not a, there's some institutions that will actually not allow you to apply for those. So you may put all the work into this, submit your grant, get approved, and have your institution, institution say, we don't allow those types of grants. So it's actually being cognizant of those pieces and how it functions at your institution. <coughs> now, timeline is key. Grants take a lot more time than you think they're going to take. And while every group will be a little bit different, on average, I recommend having about a six-month lead time. And so by six months, you should assemble your grant team and start working on the draft of your grant. By three months, you want to start going, undergoing internal review so the concept being now you're working within your small group, a lot of grants will actually have a, a requirement that either, either IRB is submitted or the IRB is approved before they'll allow you to submit the grant. So you want to have IRB submitted with a reasonable time. This may vary by institution and the complexity of the project. Um, one way to kind of skirt this a little bit is you could submit to IRB at maybe three or four months with your preliminary draft and then just do an amendment later. So adjust it as you need to, depending on how quick your IRB is. But be cognizant of that and make sure you, again, going back to the RFA, make sure you see if it requires an IRB is actually completed or if it's approved, because that will affect your times on it. And then you have to get letters. And this includes letters from your chair, from your collaborators, from your mentor, and from your grant office. Almost every institution has a grant office that, requires to, that is required to give approval on this. And they actually require the full document, so that means it needs to be completed and ready for them to sign. And oftentimes, it can take up to a month to do. So again, you can see how some of these delays can happen if we don't plan accordingly. That's why the six-month lead time is so important, because it allows you time for these little micro steps that have to happen sequentially. And one more thing, actually, on this topic. Um, when we're talking about grants in, in general, the key is to try to get early if you can. Now, we're all inherently procrastinators. I don't know about you. I'm a procrastinator. Whatever deadline you give me, I might give myself a fake deadline to make it earlier. But I will pick that time. And you know, when you're submitting slides for a presentation, you're submitting a talk, you can pretty much skirt it down to about half an hour before the deadline. And it'll be fine. You might get a couple emails, no big deal. 
And you can do that with a grant and still, and still make your deadline. They're very strict, so if you miss your deadline, you're out for a whole year. But you can make your deadline. Here's the problem with that that doesn't apply to everything else we usually do when we procrastinate. Grants are reviewed in the order they're received. So if you are the last person at the last second of the last minute at the last hour of the last day, you are the last grant at the end of all these other great applications. At the end of all of the fatigue of reading through these, you are the last person. And that puts you at a significant disadvantage. So just being cognizant, try and submit earlier if you can, because it actually does impact you if you're the last person. Now, when we're saying a grant, these are my kind of prime four people that you always want to reach out to. You want to make sure your chair's on board. You want to talk to your research uh, director to make sure that, A, that they're on board, that you have the resources available. They can help give you internal review. Um, the research coordinator is really helpful, too, just to make sure that you have, if you ha are using research assistance for the study, that they're actually available during that time period. But the other thing is, within your institution, there's often, especially if you're new to grants or new to grants at your institution, there are specific components that may be necessary and specific people you may need to talk to for approval. So it's important to talk to them early to figure out if there are specific meetings, maybe pre-approval meetings that you have to schedule on the books to make sure you don't miss the deadline because of one meeting that you just didn't know had happened. So take advantage of people who have been there before and who are in charge of this as part of the job. Now, when you're assembling your team, here are the key roles that I think about. Now, there's a primary investigator. Typically, that will be you, but it doesn't have to be. Your first grant, you can also join in as an observer and just learn the process vicariously. Now, with the, along with the primary investigator, you want to have a topic expert that may be you and may not be. If this is an arena that you're not as familiar with or that you haven't published as much in, it's really helpful to have someone who has topic expertise. Not only because they'll make sure that we don't miss any key articles, especially if they're, as, edu as we know as educators, they are published in a number of different journals, some of which we may not know about. But also it lends validity when you apply and you say, I have someone that's published 30 papers in this topic. That strengthens your credentials and makes you a much more competitive applicant. You want to have someone that has methodological expertise if it's something you haven't done. If you're applying for a scoping review grant, there is funding, by the way, for scoping reviews. If you're applying for a qualitative grant and you've never done it before, not only is it important for your study, but it's important to prove to the grant reviewer that this is something that you can do. And this is one way by demonstrating someone with topic expertise. You want to make sure that you have a good mentor, someone who can, someone basically who is able to um, assist you with this product, with this, with this kind of project, someone who is experienced in this arena, and someone who, again, who, has a, who is a little bit more senior. Unless you're fairly senior in your career, most grant applications require you to have a project mentor. So you want to have someone that's going to add value. So oftentimes I try to combine my project mentor with someone who has content or methodological expertise to bring that to the table. And then when you think about collaborators, you want to have collaborators that you've worked with before. You want to trial them out before a grant, not just because grants are much higher stakes, but when you go ahead and you're applying out for the grant, one of the things they look for is, have you guys worked together before? And if you have all new collaborators you've never collaborated with, it makes a weaker application versus saying, we've published five papers together before. I know we work well together. And your job is to create confidence in your application. Now, project description is probably the most important part of your application. And it comes into four pieces. There's the specific aims, there's the significance, the innovation, and the approach. So the specific aims page is kind of like the abstract or the pitch. Most of our research proposals when we're trying to do a grant, we're trying to sell someone that concept. We're doing a sales pitch. We want to get money for this project. We're trying to convince them why they should do it. But grant, review, grant reviewers, are, it's a big group. Most of them will not read your entire application. They will read this specific aims page. You will have one to two people who will read your whole application. Everyone else, this is all they see of you. So this is your opportunity in one single page to try to sell it and to try to help your grant reviewer to sell you as a reliable resource. So it's worth putting a lot of time into this. It will not win your application, but a poorly written one can absolutely lose your application. And so when we talk about specific aims, it breaks down into four paragraphs. The first one is your introductory paragraph. You're basically selling them on the concept. Why is it important? So if I were to go do a study on burnout, I might lead with, burnout is present in 76% of EM residents as associated with an increased rate of mental health issues, substance abuse, and suicide. In that one sentence, 
You grab attention. This is why it matters. It affects over three quarters of residents. This is how it can affect them. And then you follow it with the evidence. You say, okay, this is why. These are the, these are the pieces that can affect it. Here's the existing data. In medical education, this is where we would add our conceptual framework, which we'll get to in just a little bit. We say, what's the problem? And then we follow it with, what's, you know, what's the rationale? Why do I need to address this, and how am I going to address this? Why is your team uniquely poised to address it? So it's not just how is your question able to address it. You're going to narrow it down. You're going to say, why is your team uniquely poised for this? We talk about specific aims, and your specific aims should follow along to the challenge you're trying to address. So typically, there's about two to four specific aims. And they're going to be presented out, laying out kind of one by one. These are what I hope to achieve in a little bit more of a granular, a little bit more of a specific layout. So it should be focused. They should be specific. They should say, this is what I hope to accomplish. Now, when you're writing specific aims, the key is to make sure they are not codependent. And what that means is if specific aim one cannot be done for some reason, that should not preclude specific aims two, three, four from being able to be done. One should not inhibit the other. And when you're writing them out, you want to make sure they're focused, you want to make sure they're specific, you want to make sure they're feasible. So when grant reviewers are looking at this, they're assessing, okay, with this aim, can they do this project in this amount of time with this amount of money? And if you're overzealous with it, that will be a red flag for them. Because again, they're conservative. They want to make sure that this is a feasible use of their money. So you're almost better being a little bit more, more uh, conservative with your specific aims than being overzealous if you're going to do it. And when you lay these out, these should be hypotheses presented as a PICO format. So population, intervention, control, outcome, timing. You can write it as a paragraph, and often it is written as like a, a, a really long sentence. But you may have to make sure it completely kind of lays out your PICO formatting for this. And at the end, you're going to talk about your so you're going to do your kind of overall impact. So this ends up with why this matters. How is it going to affect society? How is it going to affect the field? What is it going to bring? What is it, how is it going to help the grant funding agency? Showing to them why this matters. You're basically closing out your pitch of value. And you'll see up here there's a QR code on the top right. That, if you uh, take your phone and you kind of zoom in and click on it, will link you to the NI specific aims page, which basically goes through a bunch of different examples of how to do a specific aims paper. It has a lot of really successful um, applications of this. If you guys do not want to go through that route, you can also just Google NI specific aims. It's the first thing that comes up right away. But it's really, really helpful because you can see how people have done it from all different forms of grants and start comparing with how you're going to lay yours out. So after you get your specific aims page, you start off with your first thing, which is your significance. Your significance is why does this matter? It's an introduction. Think about like the introduction of, your pa of a paper you're going to write. Why does this matter? You're expanding out what you started the first paragraph of a specific aims page with. And you're going to add evidence. In medical education, we're going to add at least one conceptual framework. There are very few med ed studies that will not require a conceptual framework here. You generally don't want more than two conceptual frameworks. In general, one is sufficient here. And you could find 20 conceptual frameworks that will help to enlighten why you're doing this study. But at a certain point, it makes it disorganized. And you only have so much space on your page. So often, you're better off just having one that you know really, really well instead of including five or six here. And so your goal here is to try to sell them on why this is important. One other thing I sometimes will add into here is I'll add a statement of why this is why um, the prior literature doesn't address this. So I might say something along the lines of, however, I often like to signpost it with a phrase that will tra track it for them. So for example, however, prior literature has not, pr has not addressed this. Or previous studies were limited by this. So it's very clear to them what your, what your specific niche is. We sometimes do a poor job of signposting it. And so it can get lost in there, even though it makes sense to us. So having keywords like limitations or missing will help flag it for the reviewer. So it's very easy for them after reading 10 applications to know what you're addressing. The other thing I'll sometimes add into here is a statement of urgency. So you might add in there something along the lines of, this is a public health concern that is impacting people every single day. Because when they're reading your application, now they know, oh, I got to fund it this year. 
Not, this is a cool application, I'll fund it in three years. It gives them the urgency to apply now. We talk about the innovation. So here you're going to talk about how you plan to address this, this challenge. So your significance is what's the problem, right? Burnout is a problem in emergency medicine. My innovation is how do I plan to address it? Why, what are my, what's, my, what's my general big picture strategy? Not your methods, but your general big picture strategy. Why is it unique? Why are you uniquely qualified as a person, as a team? What do you bring to the table? What resources? What experience? How is your addressing of this different than what's been done pri previously? What is this, why is this uniquely poised to address this specific challenge? Then the approach. The approach is your methods. It's basically going to lay out how you're going to address it. And it should be written similar to how a method section would be in a paper, which is nice because you can copy it forward. There's a few unique features of writing an approach that are different from a method. One of which is that you want to include in there your rationale for why you're doing the study type. You want to defend your, your actual methods in this section. And the other is the limitations. All studies have limitations, we're aware of it, and some of them are not always able to be avoided. So you want to include your limitations and discuss how you would address them. For example, resident recruitment, here's how I'll address this limitation. Or maybe it's something that you're okay with and you're going to justify why it's acceptable for this type of study. We expect we won't have 100% recruitment, here's why, and here's okay, here is why it's okay. Here's the value. We want to be able to address the limitations and why they're okay or how we'll address them in this section. So biosketches. This is um, basically the NIH's version of a CV. It's a targeted CV for us, for our applications. Interestingly enough, this one seems to get sh kind of shoved by the wayside a lot of times because people will write their first biosketch and that's it and they're done. And the problem is, outside of your description of your project, this is the second biggest factor in how you get funded because it says you as a person and you as a team are reliable. Right? Grant funders are conservative. We want to make sure we're allaying their fears. And so we're doing a biosketch and we're going to go through kind of some of the key pieces in just a moment. You want to make sure that you're tailoring it in towards the specific application. If you have an old biosketch, you need to retailor it to here. That means tailoring it to your collaborators. If you have new collaborators in the study, you want to mention how you've collaborated with them previously. And so biosketches, okay. the first section is personal statement. This is one to two paragraphs of who you are, why you matter, why you are the person to address this. You want to talk about the, comp the unique things that you bring to the table, your experience, your experience with projects in general, with this type of a project, with this type of a group. Again, you want to have a central theme that you're good at collaborating and good at collaborating with this type of a group. You want to talk about your prior experience with, with grants, and you want to say why, why it matters to select you specifically. You're pitching yourself in this type of a statement. Positions and honors. So this is where you're going to lay out things that are relevant, things that demonstrate your history of, rel of experience in this arena, of leadership and reliability. And I think we sometimes forget that latter, that latter piece. Showing that we've been a peer reviewer for several years, showing that we've been an editor, showing that we've been a course director, showing that we're involved in related committees, all that stuff shows reliability, especially if you show it over time. Now the biggest pitfall I see with this is that people put things, I don't know if you guys know, it's supposed to be in chronological order. So it's the oldest things at the top and they work their way down. That small thing of having it flipped is a, usually a big flag to reviewers saying that you're an, a novice submitter and that we can't follow instructions. But it's often all lost in the concept. You write this amazing proposal and then they say, wait a second, this is a reverse. Oh, they've probably never done this before. And that little thing can have a big impact. It's like the person who wears scrubs outside the hospital. Oh, that's cool. You're, you're trying it out now. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's showing signs of being more novice, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a flag for us of saying that we should, we should be doing it chronological. So that small difference can actually make a big impact on how you're received. The contributions to science is probably the most common area that, I see, that we see errors in. Um, because what people do is that commonly, and I did this actually for my first grant until I was, you know, shown by a mentor that this was not the right way, is I put my list of all my publications, just as a full list. And I think that's what seems logical to us, but the contributions of science is actually specific contributions. It should be five total. It's one paragraph that defines what you've done, and it can be grouped by either your topic, for example, um, exam, uh, uses of flipped classroom in graduate medical education, or it can be by a methodology. Here's my experience in qualitative. Here's my experience in scoping. But you want to have a paragraph that summarizes out 
this contribution, and then four supporting citations. You can add at the end a link to Google Scholar. Um, a lot of NIH and other bigger funders prefer that you use Science CV or PubMed CV. But something, you can include a link to your list of your other publications. But you want to structure this out so it actually identifies the contribution, what it adds, and then your supporting citations. And then finally, you want to include your research support. Um, if you don't have existing research support, that's totally okay. Just put none in there. Part of the idea is that, especially with some of these smaller grants, that this may be your first form of research support for this. If you have research support, you want to include how you've been supported. So what was the overall funding? What was your specific role? You do not have to include your percentage of time, though. You don't have to include your percentage of that role, but you want to include that you're a site PI or a lead PI, what your specific role is in that application. Um, there's a tendency sometimes to delete that section because it's none and I don't, it doesn't apply to me. Um, that will flag it as an incomplete application, so make sure you include just none is totally fine. You can also include if you've had some non-clinical support or institutional support because it shows the institution trusts you. If you had some starter support, even if it's not a formal grant, you can put that in here to demonstrate that your institution believes in you and has faith in you because that helps to gain more trust and more confidence in your application. Um, when you get other people's bio sketches, be really careful to go through and check them. Um, not only for some of the pearls and pitfalls we talked about earlier, but people have a tendency because we're all super busy to say, oh, that's cool, here, here's my old bio sketch. It's a year old, it's fine. And that's fine, a lot of the data probably won't have changed. The problem is that first piece. That personal statement will not be tailored to this project. And it won't be tailored to you. Because ideally, if you're picking your collaborators, your collaborators should have worked with you on something previously. And this is your opportunity to show that we're all on the same page, to remind your reviewer time and time again, we've worked together, we've worked together, we've worked together. So they have that as a piece that they can help to show off for you. Um, up here, you see again another QR code. This is for the NIH Biosketches page. You can also Google NIH Biosketches. It'll pull that same concept up there. It shows you a lot of different Biosketches. It also has the most up-to-date version so you have a version you can use. They update every three or four years, so you do want to be checking that before you're submitting a new grant application, but they're usually very, very similar in format, and the columns usually are about the same. For your letters of support, again, your goal here is to demonstrate why your team is the best, most qualified team to do it, how you've collaborated before, and, and, and include as much as possible specific examples of how you've collaborated in something, so you sell the same message on the same page and what they bring to the table. For our mentor's letter, it's going to be very similar to the collaborator letter with one exception. It needs to include a, se a section on why they are the best mentor for your project. They should be pitching what they bring to the table as a mentor, their experience mentoring, what their niche is in that, what prior successful mentorships they've had, and what they plan to do as a mentor. Again, it sells why this is structured because you're going to be relying a little bit on the mentor to help to sell your application of why you're qualified for this. There's a section here that often gets uh, kind of overlooked, facilities, resources, and environment. And a lot of that, you know, a portion of that is just, we have a facility that has these number of patients per year, and they have these number of residents, and this type of medical student. And that's really helpful, and you want to know what the educational resources are available. But you also have a lot of other resources you, that you may not consider adding that you probably should. This can include things like we have, our, we have research assistants 24 hours a day, or we have them this number of hours. We have three NIH funded grant research in our departments. That tells them that you have someone that can, out, can extra mentor you. You can include in there, for example, that um, as an institution we have this much funding. All of this helps to, we have in-house statisticians. All these things help to show that you have a lot of resources available that will back you. We're going to talk very briefly about budget because that can be either the easiest or the hardest part. These are the, these are the kind of eight key things that I keep in mind when I'm applying for a budget. And how I think about it is I have a fixed amount of money. I'm applying for a 10 or a 25 or a $100,000 grant. And I just work backwards. So I start off with study tools, the things I physically need to run my study. My patient recruitment costs, my RA costs, my supplies. I think about the things that I must have. And then I add on the bonuses. I talk about, I look for open access publication fees, travel to conferences. I start to back calculate through it. You might you want to make sure if you have a statistician you have to pay that is not, that has a uh, fee associated with them, that you factor that into the application. And if it exceeds your application, make sure you talk to your chair early 
so that you can buffer that application funding to make sure you have enough available. And again, going back to the grant, make sure that you assess, if you're filing for non-clinical, make sure they actually allow that in the RFA, the request for application. Because if they don't and you put it on your budget, it's a flag to them, you haven't read it. And that can, again, really uh, injure your application. So this was a very fast summary of this, meant to highlight the key pearls and pitfalls, but really, the main take home points are, make sure you have enough time. If you're going to apply for a grant, minimum six months. Make sure you build in the time to do that. Make, try to get as much feedback as possible. Utilize your mentors, you utilize your colleagues. Find someone who is outside of your field who can give you an external opinion on why this study matters. Make sure you do a thorough literature search. Tailor the grant application to the grant. So try to avoid any type of a cookie cutter application. It should consistently align with what they want to sell you from the RFA. And a lot of us fail. I failed my first grant. I did horribly, and I got better. That, think about the first time going back to our H&Ps. We did horrible on our first H&P. And we tried again. And then we tried again. And you get better and better and better. It's a learning experience. And the only way to really learn this is to trial it out. So with that, I want to thank you guys for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I also put my Twitter handle up here. You guys can message me on Twitter anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions as they come up as well. Thanks. So that reminds me of one key piece before that is um, plug for the handout. The handout has a list of pages and pages of education-specific grant opportunities with websites and timelines and funding. Now, separate from that, I haven't seen great resources out there on specific like budgets or um, applications that people have put out there for grants for uh, MedEd. Most of them are going to be somewhat similar in terms of following the structure and the rules, um, especially for budgeting. There's not too much that changes in there just being conscious of, you know, um, make sure that you're aware that the, the funding is often smaller, so some of your overhead, your indirects may not be applicable. Um, the key and the, really the biggest piece that people um, that these differ from is the presence of some type of a cognitive framework. So you have the conceptual framework that says this is why it works. Um, that's almost universal in med ed research and almost <coughs> invisible in any other form of research. So making sure that you build that into the grant is really a key piece of there. But um, I haven't, but if I do find one, I will tweet it out a whole bunch. Yes? Um, do you have an easy place for us to go to for med ed, like sources for med ed funded research? Um, yeah, so I haven't seen a single website that combines them. There are several websites that include parts of them, um, including the SAM website have some of them. Um, it's on the handout that I sent out. We also have a paper we published um, that uh, is, on, is in WestGem that includes a whole list of all the relevant meta articles as well. Um, but I haven't seen a living document that done, that's done that yet, but it would be great. If you want to create one, I would gladly go there. Yeah, all of our free time. Right? <laughs> I know. Uh, any other Agreed. And I, I, would, I would highly recommend going to grants.gov if you haven't been there before, because it does have a lot of search features, and there are thousands of grants out there. Um, and there are a number that you could probably... So one way that I, can, that I pitch education research when I'm trying to sell it as a grant, let's say, for example, that, I'm ta that I want to do a study on mastery learning for central lines. This has been done before, but assuming this is an original thought that we just did today. Mastery learning and central lines, I would pitch this as, this is going to be a study looking at uh, teaching central lines to residents, and it has the, impact, the ability to decrease central line infections. And that's how you're going to sell it to the bigger group. That's how you're going to sell it federally. It's not talking about the resident piece of it, but talking about how this will then lead to the downstream of it. And if it does, that's awesome. That's your Kirkpatrick level four huge outcome. 
But even if it doesn't, you can still get funded to do your study, which will still give you your Kirkpatrick 1, 2, and maybe some 3. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.